Good evening and welcome to Conversations with Artists, hosted by the University of Maryland Center for Art and Knowledge at the Phillips Collection. I'm Catherine Rogge, Exhibitions Coordinator and Manager of Academic Initiatives. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce this program. Conversations with Artists is a jointly held program between the Phillips Collection and the University of Maryland. Founded in 2006, this series provides an opportunity to hear from and speak with leading contemporary artists in, a formal, in an informal setting. Tonight, we are featuring artist Jonathan Herrera Soto. Uh, Jonathan graduated with a BFA from the Minneapolis College in Art and Design in 2017. Recent solo exhibitions of his work include In Between slash Underneath at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, Querida Presencia at the Duluth Art Institute, and Entre Rios y Montañas at the Annex Gallery in Chicago. He has participated in numerous art, art, artist residencies, some of which include Cala Art Institute in California, Yaro in New York, Santa Fe Art Institute in New Mexico, High Point Center for Printmaking in Minnesota, and Kimmel Harding Nelson Center in Nebraska. His work has been featured in Bomb Magazine, Hyperallergic, and other publications. Jonathan is a recent recipient of the Santo Foundation Individual Artist Award in 2018, Minnesota State Arts Board Artist Initiative Grant in 2018, Metro Regional Arts Council Next Step Grant in 2019, Brown University Artist Initiative Community Development Grant in 2020, and is a current 2019 to 2021 Jerome Hill Artist Grant Fellow. Jonathan will be in conversation this evening with Martin Gonzalez. Martin is an interdisciplinary artist from Texas. His family's roots anchor deep in the land between San Antonio and Northern Co Coahuila. Uh, he is a Tejano of both Mexican and Texas Indian descent. He is currently in the graduate program at the University of Maryland for Studio Arts. Before grad school, he was the mascot for the Dallas Zoo's dinosaur exhibit where he operated a 16 foot Dilophosaurus suit interacting with park goers. He no longer works at the Dallas Zoo but is still wearing costumes and interacting with the public. Thank you both for joining us this evening and thanks to all of you at home. As you listen to Jonathan and Martin this evening, please type your questions into the Q&A chat for this program. We will have a Q&A session at the conclusion of this talk. Without further ado, Jonathan, Please tell us about your work. Thank you so much, um, Catherine, for the kind introduction. Um, thank you, Martin, for sharing um, your time with me. And thank you to everyone who's joining us tonight. Um, my name is uh, Jonathan Herrera Soto. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, and I'm currently a visitor on ancestral Narragansett lands, also known as Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I will share my screen and let you in on some of the stuff that I think about um, and who I am and what I do. Um, I'm gonna set a timer just to make sure that I don't go over. Um, like I said, my name is Jonathan and in this picture, um, I am the little one in a red shirt in the bottom right hand corner um, with, this, with missing front teeth. Um, most of the people that you see are my immediate and extended family. Um, and the majority of, of, of those pictured are un undocumented. Um, I'm part of the, a generation of the younger kids that um, were born in the US um, and therefore have uh, citizenship. Um, I often say that I was born into, uh, into the world as a witness to an American experience that's, that's not fully my own. Um, I kind of feel like a tourist um, witnessing you know, the reality um, and the violence that um, my undocumented family endures and undergoes. Um, while having the privilege of being a U.S. citizen, it almost feels like I'm behind glass. Um, and I, I grew up in the U.S. and, you know, like now I am more fluent in English and I'm able to speak to you in a way that I can't speak to um, my immediate family members and loved ones. Um, 
and in this fracturing and in this um and through the through my american experience i um i have chosen the path of an artist as a printmaker to convey the stories and narratives of um uh, these traumatic and violent stories that have molded me um i am a printmaker and i use cer um, the ceremony of printmaking um as a as a ritual in wounding um by gashing into the matrix in into um uh, materials such as lithostones and woodblocks to render images, and I'm interested in this inherent in this inherent violence that's um, embedded within the me the medium itself. Um, I also am interested in this idea of record and archive. I use various means of mark making in order to create a a record, um, and through my mark making, I try to capture the experience um, of those of of the lives and stories that have molded me. And in this installation, I I use my my handprints with um, using charcoal to render abstract images of landscape, um, um, archived photos that depict um, the discovery and the uncovering of mass graves in Mexico, um, and using the signifier that it that that is able to ar archive the, the human body, which is the fingerprint. And we use fingerprints to um, archive people when they're crossing borders or when they're um, being archived for prison records. And it's this kind of universal signifier that um, we use to um, keep record of the human body, but also is a dehumanizing flattening of the experience of what it means to be human. Um, I also use site specificity as a form of inquiry. Um, this is an image of a couple of studies that I did in um, Utah as a resident at the at the epicenter, um, where I incorporated my my own body on on a riverbank and and created um, poetry from these rocks that I printed on using a Xerox transfer method, um, and then. At, at, after the performance, I would leave the poem somewhere else for some for someone else to find um, and uh, create another experience with um, a passerby or um, an anonymous um, uh, art viewer. I um, am interested in also the the gesture of ephemerality. Um, and this is an example where I printed um, the picture of a, of a body that you all don't have access to the information of who that is, but using that premise of you not knowing of this an an anonymity um, as a tool, and then um, print, printing on, on the ground um, with water and to have it uh, erode under the sun and evaporate uh, minutes later. Um, I. I, I kind of describe my practice as as a mound of debris often and um, and in in this mountain of debris I'd like to I also like to think about it as a, as a living record. Um, this is an example of a study I did as an artist in residence um, at, at Yaddo in upstate New York where I carried um, the text of a poem on my back and made a gesture in the snow um, when on top of a frozen lake. And often I don't know where an artwork will go, but what I do know is that I'm collecting a lot of information. I'm collecting a lot of things that work, that don't work, and ultimately creating this archive that breathes and expands. And by that, I mean, sometimes studies or works that don't become art end up informing other studies or work. This performance um, informed uh, the um, uh, love poem drawing that, that I did um, probably half year or a year later. And I think in that way, my artwork is often in reference to each other and incorporates itself to each other. Um, and it's it's like a portal to other sides that aren't necessarily the, the ceremony of um, printmaking. I, I incorporate texts that my mom sent, sends me. I incorporate pictures of, uh, foliage or plants or objects that I, I 
um, take while on, on my jog. And in that way, everything becomes um, artwork to, to me or the potential for our artwork to manifest. Um, these, I often also create rubbings um, in the various re residencies that, that I attend, um, having this like um, collision of various uh, aesthetic gestures informing each other, creating a, a new narrative. Um, and in that way, I like to think about, you know, me as an artist traveling through time, being informed and directly impacted by my past self. You know, I'm in conversation with things that have happened, but also in that way, I am in direct conversation with versions of myself that don't exist yet, that will happen. And in that way, um, my work kind of travels through time back and forth. Um, and I've been talking a lot about printmaking in this very abstract um, physical way, but I also, it's also a worldview. Like if we imagine in this diagram of, of, of a print, if A is the world, right? Like if A is the colonial world writ written by the victors, um, written by crys crystallizations of power of, by governments, um, then printmaking as an apparatus has the inherent ability to dislodge that information from the matrix, from, from A, from the world, and create a new story um, as evidence pulling from, from the world. And therefore printmaking to me is this gesture of undoing and, and, and remaking the world. Um, and I have an example uh, in that um, in 2019, I put together this exhibition, Doc documenting uh, the portraits of 200 missing and murdered Mexican journalists. Um, and I, I chose the, the, the topic because it, it, it is both simultaneously hyper-visible and invisible um, because it continues to, to happen. I, I only depicted two, 200 portraits because those are the portraits I had access to. Many and many of the portraits images don't don't exist for them or they disappeared or were murdered before um, the the um, invention of the internet so so there's this fast fast record of these people that um, about like like half less than half we, we have um, tangible image ev evidence for and um, in in this exhibition I, I documented and individually hand cut, through the process of stencil making um, the portraits of, of these journalists and printed on the floor of the Minneapolis Institute of Art um, with this mud mixture made of uh, sawdust, charcoal, um, uh, un unfired clay, and um, printed printed the, the, the portraits with this mixture because because it is it is of the earth it is of burial it it roots the museum this this beacon of archive to the ground and to the soil it's on um, and in in printing on the floor and inviting audiences to walk through the installation they're participating in the act of erasure um, the act of erasure that the, the Mexican government it wants these bodies to pertain to this this narrative of erasure of disappearance. Um, so printmaking allowed me to pull narrative from the archive um, and uh, have that breathing gesture um, uh, inform inform the, the story I want to maybe not rewrite but um, uh, to to showcase to to audience members as as an artist that has that that has that um, a privilege. Um, all right, so here's a here's a here's a threshold space. Um, this exhibition happened in um, at the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020. I was doing the art the artist residency thing. The um, I visited Mexico to um, see family and then I spent some time here in Providence. But the biggest thing that happened to me and all of us was the pandemic hit. And I, I realized at the time in March, a year, for, whoa, a year ago, last year, um, that a lot of my making, you know, although it is rooted in this language of ceremony, of, 
of ritual of violence and reanimating that violence. Um, it was very codependent on the institution that there was always some place to show, always somewhere to be. Um, and I, I, I realized that without you know the codependent element of the institution, I kind of dislodged my making and didn't know how to tap into ceremony um, anymore. And I went all of spring and summer without making too much. And then I think I realized that you know no one was reading artist statements. No, everyone was focused on taking care of like themselves and their family and their loved ones. That it was it was fertile soil to rewrite you know or really inquire the process in which I was making. Um, I want to be true to the process of, of ceremony in my practice. And so what I did was tap into ceremonies that already exist within my immediate family. I didn't have the tools to start from my own. So I, 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 I peeked over to, to what my family's doing and a, a language that is very, is, has been, has been inherent in my media family is this gesture of repair and through maintenance, specifically on the body of a car. Um, I, I think it derives from this like inherent resourcefulness that perhaps um, m migrant families or under-resourced families undergo in into you know if you can't if you can't um, if you don't have the the money to to um, take the car to a mechanic you fix it yourself and I think that's where it originally came from. Now I, I think it's them. My older brother likes to tinker, and but there's this there's this gesture of repair and and a ritual that already exists. So I, I, I learned from from being a witness to to the ceremony. Um, it it I think it's been happening as far as I can remember. And it was it was quite the gift to realize that I could tap into a ceremony that already is there and bring it into my art practice. Um, you, I don't have to rewrite something from scratch. And um, what what I did was I bought this like almost junkyard uh, truck and start, and it was like a, a hazard. It was a, it, it was a hazard to run, Every, like the whole bottom was rusted out. And I I started to, to, to replicate and mimic this gesture of repair and maintenance um, on my own you know, kind of like as a gesture of autonomy. And, um, and what, what ended up happening is, is, is a, a project made and exhibited quite literally as a process of learning. You're watching me learn something new and how to repair. Um, and like most of my artwork, it's, it's simply um, a poetic or um, an indicator um, for repair as a whole, like re repair that we all undergo or repair that I'm going through in my own life and um, using the, the car body as, as a vehicle for, for that. Um, I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna say that around this time, I, I'm, I'm also thinking about uh, the wooden palette. It's always, you know, like kind of going back, going back to um, uh, the fact that palettes have been part of my practice for uh, since I, since, you know, since 2018, 19, um, remembering that that is a component of my practice and, uh, incorporating it into this new body of work. Um, the wooden palette is, is, um, you know, made of the utmost economy. It is, uh, rendered disposable when it's no longer of use. And, um, it's brown like our skin. It is, you know, like it smells like cedar. It's, it smells good. So it's like it has the, a bunch of these contradicting, like elements that 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 make it into being. Um, and and I'm interested in in the wooden palette's contradictions. It spends they spend their whole life horizontal. And as, as an artist, I bring them up and I and I look at them vertically. Um, I'm also interested in. Uh, migration trails and the debris left behind as marker for uh, human presence. Um, and I use it as an, an aesthetic uh, resource, uh, as, as, as a reference. Um, my friend, um, Jonathan Orozco, who recently we had a chat, uh, uh, informed me that, that the Latin, Amer Latin American lineage um, has a, a history of ceremony around violence 
that isn't necessarily all traumatic. That um, this is a screenshot of an of a of a painting that depicts um, Mayan ruler um, Shiel Jaguar and his principal wife um, undergoing a ceremony where she's um, piercing her tongue with a barbed um, cord in celebration of one of his wives uh, giving birth, and it's this interesting. It's, it's this interesting reference where this this gesture of wounding that I've been incorporating in my printmaking practice is being used as a celebration of life. Um, and it's, you know, it's really like throwing my practice like head, head over heels because what does it mean to celebrate and use ceremony and violence as um, uh, um, yeah, as a celebration um, and Whereas in, I think I, I, I use, I traditionally use violence as a form of trauma and remembering and dread. And um, so, it's, so, so it's interesting. And this is kind of the work that I'm making now uh, using scarification and found objects, bringing in a bunch of debris to create narrative from the inside. So I think I started this presentation describing my practice as an artist, looking at the art world and Bring it in, bringing it into the studio and informing my practice. I'm currently in a place where I'm pulling from the depths and pulls from inside and making and showing that tenderness to the audience. And it's a bit more illegible, it's a bit more fragmented. Um, but that's where my heart's currently guiding me and I'm choosing to follow. Um, I want to end on a, a note, but your, there's this thing here. All right. Cast as an act of love and as an act of uh, disruption, translation becomes a means of repositioning the subject in the world and in history, a means of rendering self-knowledge foreign to itself, a way of denaturalizing citizens, taking them out of the comfort zone of national space, daily ritual and pre-given domestic, pre domestic arrangements. So I think that kind of encapsulates everything I've tried to say and um, using printmaking as an act of love. And first and foremost, I'm a printmaker and thinking about that as a form of inquiry. inquiry. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Nice, nice, good stuff, dude, good stuff. Um, well, how, well, I'll start with the first question. How are you doing today? How are you doing? How are you feeling? A little thirsty? You doing good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I think I, I always have, um, I don't know, like re remembering a memory. Like presentations always give me the um, gift to be able to look at something again. And there's always something new to uncover. So feeling mm -hmm. grateful for the opportunity to look, look at the things that I think I know, but don't really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What within that? What's a what's a memory that you feel like you re remembered going over this stuff today? Um, I laid out all my slides, and um, something about the collapsing of time and time traveling is new. You know, like they're the same slides. Like I, it's my work. It's current work that I don't really know how to talk about, and. I don't know, something about putting these slides together for tonight. I, I saw that it kind of feels like traveling back and forth in time when I talk about my work as a mound of debris, you know, like kind of like stuff that I, I've made will, I know it will inform stuff I will make, even if it doesn't necessarily make it as an art, make it as a finished artwork. And often I approach my work as an arrangement. So things come together and then fall apart. Maybe like, for example, that mud, mud print uh, installation I did at the museum gave um, me the idea to, 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 you know, like the de-installation of the work and um, was an opportunity to make a performance. So what I ended up doing was mopping it, mopping away the faces and inviting audiences to come and participate. Um, I know this about my practice, that things inform each other quite literally. And that's something I never, I haven't really thought about yet though, that that um, inherent,
collaboration between works or between ideas throughout time kind of is like a little bridge that I can climb on. And like, like um, it's both hopeful and comforting because I think I know my relationship with my past selves pretty intimately. I'm often returning to old ideas or old works, but like, whoa, if I just pivot and look ahead, I'm, I'm like someone that, you know, my future self is remembering to kind of pull ahead. And it's like, it's like a weird stretch in time. Yo, who's that future self, dude? Tell me about that. Who do you see? Who's Jonathan? Who's Jonathan in the future? What's that future self look like? Um, yeah, yo. Um, this, like I mentioned, this, the pandemic has, is the, the silver lining of the pandemic has really sh showed me that I, I, I was, and I had the tendency to be super codependent to the institution, like make work for shows, make work for residencies, apply to residencies, do the circuit. Like, and um, I wanna align my future self with the ceremony of, with what I do, which is like to remember and to honor um, stories that, um, you know, through printmaking, I have I have the opportunity and privilege to do. Um, I think the most sacred thing I have to give is my time, you know, like to cut out all those stencils. Those last images I showed are burned like individually with 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 a wood burner, and it takes like an like a lot of time to render an image on a palette. And um, that's part of the process is that the most valuable thing I have to give is the little time I have on earth and um, how to extend that. So sometimes it's like how to extend a process super long because it's super important. Um, and it's all in the studio. So I just wanna like pivot and be an approach my life in the thoughtfulness that is kind of like um, galvanized with that, with with that sacredness, you know, like, I mean, it sounds kind of cheesy, but, you know, to make, to make for my ancestors, to make for my ghosts and hold that to be true rather than, you know, to kind of make for my ancestors, but to really make for the exhibition or to really make for how the exhibition is going to be received or stuff like that, you know, like, totally. Yeah. Just to be more transparent with the politics of the art world and, um, the contradictions to hold the contradictions that exist, um, simultaneously all, all at once, you know? Yeah, totally. I mean, I resonate with that in a huge way, just talking about the sacredness of, right. It is time. It's like what we're doing with like our love, our life force. And at times, you know, it's interesting, right? Cause I think, in that image of like that the time is the most sacred thing you have um and then talking about love and care with things you do right for example um there's that image of you walking through the snow carrying that palette right that's like a striking image with a poem written on the back um and yeah. talking about love um it's interesting right because i'm just curious to hear your thoughts on like the relationship between the parallels and perpendicular nature of uh, violence and repair, right? Like you and I talk outside of here. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I've known Jonathan for about, um, what, since 2016, 15 or something like that? Yeah, um, a little bit, a little, little chunk of change. Um, and so, yeah, so in talking about that, like we're talking about like the relationship between repair and then violence. And we talk, we've talked personally about masculinity and like intimate selves in relationship and talking about hurt. I'm just like curious about, um, yeah, how does that come in? How does like, how do you see the personal, you know, versus the public self, you know, that is the art, right? Like showing that, how do you, I guess, you know, I'm asking a broader question more than something specific here, but I just am curious to hear you riff on like the relationship between violence and healing your relationship to that and masculinity, your relationship to relationships. 
in that and how does that come into play? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think I want to step back and like uh, uh, talk about like the arc, the arc of, of an artwork, you know, like there's a beginning and then there's an end, like there's ideation, there's process, and then there's ex exhibiting, like in, 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 in what I do. Um, and, um, you know, in that arc, it's pretty neat, right? There's, ex there's experimenting, there's, you know, like, I don't know, frustration, there's everything, everything, the world is in that arc. And then, but there's a point at the end where it's, it's done. Um, and there's something in, in that arc that is complete and a circle and like confined because something's done and it's, and then to talk about like that topic of repair or like the topic of violence and that like a lot of my subject matter is of um, systemic violence, you know, like the, uh, the erased people, the, the violence that um, undocumented people undergo. And more recently, the, the, the violence that I inherited through being proximate to an undocumented experience and you know, like the hurt that happens in fragmentation in language, fragmentation in culture, um, and all of that hurt. But, you know, like trauma has secondary and tertiary shockwaves. And a lot of it, you know, comes and goes. It's a process. And it's, and a lot of it's illegible, you know, like, um, so violence being this like illegible, reoccurring process that happens to all of us you know we go through cycles of like healing and then unpacking and then mediating over long periods of time um and i, ha I have an example i'm gonna bring in an example don't don't let me forget those two things <laughs> okay with the, uh, to the okay. healing and time in the art okay i got you now go for it yeah, you right. got it. So an example i want to bring in is like um you know, like all this, like all this, like super intense trauma that we're all going through in like COVID conditions, like being, being like confined and having social distancing and kind of being weirdly isolated and like we're gonna have a hard time reintegrating into society, and a lot of us are wondering what what are the long term effects of that isolation, right? And to some in some ways I want to say like I know what the long term like like damage is that like my parents have been confined to their like Chicago apartment building for like 20 years you know with fear of police fear of driving fear of talking to anyone else you know like all you do is you know you have to go to work and come home and try to keep a low profile because you know like there's always risk and it's it's like and it's it's ongoing and it's forever. And the decisions made at the border 20 years ago to cross into the United States are still those are still happening. It's a very long, long trauma. Um, and to go back to that, to to talk about it in a complete artwork kind of yeah. has this inherent value of like it's 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 encapsulated, it's whole, this trauma that I'm talking about. But I guess what I want to, where I, I want to be honest is that a lot of it is illegible and is unfinished and is ongoing. So that's where I'm at now is this yeah. like, what does it mean to leave an artwork incomplete or clearly an assemblage of things that, that feel like they might come off or feel like they're barely hanging together, you know, like yeah. incorporating, incorporating the aesthetics of incompleteness, of unwholeness um, as a tool. Um, because that's, I feel like where I'm, I'm leading to, I'm like heading is this idea that trauma is ongoing and it's, and it's illegible and incomplete and how, how can my art making, um, reflect that, you know, and, yeah. um, have it part of a visual vocabulary that I'm working with. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that that just kind of, for me, you know, I, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, right? Like the paradox of just living and falling apart at the same time, um, you know, healing the body, repairing itself, 
until the point that it doesn't, you know, um, that seems the most, you know, fitting thing because I, I it's interesting using the aesthetic of incompleteness. Um, yeah, I don't know if you experience this, um, but oftentimes I never finish work. I've never finished. I oftentimes feel like I've never completed a piece. Um, and I think for me, you know, just referencing my own experience here, I think it's because like the healing hasn't happened. The healing hasn't stopped. The, the trauma hasn't stopped. That the lived experience continues past that. And I think that there's something about that. Um, I'm curious to hear you talk about the healing aspect of the work, right? So you referenced, um, also I have fun questions too. I got some other fun questions. You want a fun question? I throw a fun question. Finish, uh, I, 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 I wanna hear the, the, the one you got going. Okay, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so talking about like, in, like completeness versus incompleteness and knowing when a work is done versus not done. Um, no, oh, come on, brain, do it. Come back to me. Uh, well, okay. So I'm hearing like this, like, when do you know when something is done? Or like, um, I guess like- It's a little bit further than that, but you riff, right. hit it, hit it, take it, no, take it. I'm just going to touch on it just to yeah. say that like a lot, I mean, it's just, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm talking about me in that like, if you look at my portfolio, works tend to be very iconographical, like- the installation or the that the prints in the back wall of that installation are all like 30 by 40 framed works that are one of one or one of two like mono prints and this language of printmaking being you know like um what's the word like ar like archive but numbered you know like there's a way to dex edition right edition like there's this like stamp on it on like like when something's done this is this isn't this isn't real artwork this is a artist proof evidence of like the process but it isn't quite artwork so printmaking has this language of legibility and built into it but i guess that's why the i don't know like that i'm interested in like pulling back you know like um uh, I've had a bunch of people say that, you know, like specifically with the collagraphs, um, the images of the shirts, that when I have studio visits, they're like very um, pulled into the, the uh, what are they called, the, the matrixes, like the things that the prints um, are printed off of. And, you know, in print, in the language of printmaking, that's like, um, that's not part, that's not art. That's like the process you, you, you use it. And then once you're done, a lot of people destroy their matrices or X them out and make them unusable. Um, so a little bit in this vocabulary of incompleteness, I'm pulling back to, like a little bit of the curtain in that, like, what if the artwork incorporates the actual matrix, like the actual unprinted matrix of a relief block, or in, in this case, the gap, the gashes on the palettes make um, the potential for, for a print. You could ink up the palette hypothetically and print it, um, but it's left undone. It's left half finished. Um, but in that half finishedness, there's completeness also, you know, like there's this like, it's a visual object, it's a sculptural, and here I am an artist hanging up on the wall for you to see. So I don't know, like, there's a little bit about that, I don't know, the contradiction of like not not any, you know, when is something done? You know, like maybe never, but like leaning into the visual vocabulary of incompleteness, like, no, this is a matrix that hasn't been printed with a bunch of stuff on it that is about to fall off or something, you know, like yeah. kind of purposefully incorporating that language into the um, final objects. Yeah. Um... Some of you were saying or well, earlier, just like, you know, that I was reading this thing about how time, right? I mean, I saw it off. Okay, I wasn't reading. I saw a post on Instagram and a video, um, but just breaking down that all moments are already happening and have happened. And it's like, it's there, you know? And I just think, oh, that's interesting that all the works that we've ever made are already done. Like they've already been completed. If like time is already existing, 
Um, so I wonder if the idea or the notion that a work is even complete is like relevant mm. because they are and they're not at the same time. Um, all right, I'm gonna switch it up here. Um, favorite fast, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, well, in talking about like time, I'm just curious, like, how did you, um, um, well, yeah, I know we've talked, you know, about how we got into art. I'm just curious about like, um, well, no, how about this? How about, let's switch it up. Um, what's a dream? What's an art dream you have for your life? It's like a dream that you're like, well, I want that in my life at some point. Or any dream. Any Is it ice cream after now? I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, dream. I think like something, this kind of leads to that first question you asked, like, I don't know, like autonomous, like on like deinstitutionalize my practice. Um, I, you know, I think like a literal dream would be to like have space away, you know, in like rural, like rural New, New England with my partner and to like live off the land and to be like a bit on uh, like, you know, like interlaced, but in not, so there's this conversation between interdependent and codependency in that, like when something's codependent, you, um, you, you, when, you know, like it's like life or death, you know, if you, it's, it's, um, uh, it'll collapse or something. Yeah, it will, like, it will collapse. Like it's codependent. That's, a, yeah, that's a good word for it. Um, interdependence kind of is like a system of reciprocity where it's like an exchange of, of gifts. And um, to the best of my ability, I would like to harbor a practice that is rooted in interdependence with the art world. Um, and to be honest, I don't know what that looks like yet um, because we still deal with money. We still deal with power and networks and institutions. And um, uh, yeah, you know, like it's, it's hard. And also like, um, it's both things because like, I would like to honor the stories that are of me and my family. Um, uh, Which brings me to this next question. Yeah. I know you're riffing still. Um, keep going. Keep going. Well, no, I mean, just, honor, just, just honor in my family in, in a way that's that's sacred, and that's really it. I'm sorry. I feel like I interrupted you there. A little no. step in there. Is that cool? Yeah. Uh, man, well, you're talking about you know stories and archiving and histories right in the body. Um, if you're willing to share, um, well, okay, before we jump into this, uh, it, like some of the notes we were going over before we entered this space together, we were talking about lost indigeneity. Um, and I got sent an extra 23andMe DNA kit on accident that was just free. Do you want it? Do you want to take it or do you not want your DNA out there? Because it's yours if you want it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, all right. Off the record, yeah, for sure. On on the record, I don't know. It's complicated. Like I, um, for a long time, clung clung to this patriotism to like the Mexican flag, right? Like the um, I'm Mexican American. My family is undocumented from Mexico, but like there's this like underneath layer that like the Mexican government is a colonial power on indigenous land also that speaks a colonial language also and that you know um, disenfranchises um, in the indigenous peoples of of people who who to live in, in in Mexico and I think it's like both things um, that that there's this lostness that I feel with my identity, as we've talked about, like we both feel. Um, and you're from you're from Texas, and there's this like lineage 
and my family is from Iguala, a Guerrero, Mexico, which is also a, a lineage, but, but, but there's this like contradictory history of like uh, Spanish, Spanish power and Spanish rule and indigeneity that clash and that I kind I I am um, I feel like a bit lost. Um, I remember the moment that I started thinking about these things. Um, it was during a post commodity op ed talk. Post commodity is this indigenous collective in um, the West Coast, and they used this term "lost tribe" in describing um, in pe people that were at the border helping them install this like dual border art installation um, in that there's like all these brown people speaking all these different languages and brown people speak English and Spanish and indigenous languages. And um, this, they mentioned this idea of the lost tribe, like those that have, you know, traveled and walked far from their, or, you know, like directly um, forced to, ab to ab um, abandon their indigenous roots for survival. So, so I swung for a long time, you know, like uh, I'm lost. I'm like, you know, like indigenous. I just don't know how to like describe or say, or like, you know, root down. But also in that swinging, there was this disregard for the survival, you know, like, like people did, you know, in the, in like the face of colonialism did everything they could, to, you know, to survive like every living being on this planet would like to do, you know? And there's something in that honoring the survival, the fact that you and I and everyone tuning in is alive, that the, everything that has been done, you know, to, to keep breath in for you, you know, like that wisdom of like uh, thinking about uh, the generation in front of you, like I think, it's manifested in all of us. Like we're here after, after like so much like, like tumultuous, like brutal uh, systems. And um, there's something in, in that that I want to honor. So it's so now I, I don't really know. I don't really know who who to have patriotize who to have patriotism for or or what. Um, but what I do have access to is my immediate family. You know, like the you know the the people. The knowledge bearers that are alive that I still have access to and being grateful for that access while I have it. Um, so I don't know. I think I'll take your DNA test, but I'm I'm scared. I'm scared and also like ner nervous. Like it says I'm white. What? No. Um, what the hell? No, we uh, you're a little bit white. I mean, yeah, right. We're like Spanish. Uh, yeah, I man. You know, I mean, I think about that. You know, because it's like you know with assimilation and all that. Um, I mean, it's interesting, just growing up in Texas, we have this thing called Texas history, where uh, they just like educate, you know, it's like the education of where it's like, oh, we were educated in a way that doesn't acknowledge our indigeneity, right? Because it's like, if you and I as like Latinos or Chicanos or whatever language we use, we're brought up with the understanding and the knowledge that we do come from an indigenous backing you know, that, that would be a shift in power, right? That would be an acknowledgement of that. But also at the same time, I totally hear you in like not knowing where you fit. And, you know, in the last couple of years, my relationship in navigating that has been, um, you know, it's like, how do you navigate that, right? Because you don't want to take up space that isn't yours. You don't want to right. appropriate something that isn't yours. But at the same time, how do you trace back to who you are? You know, and I think family is a great place to start. Um, cool. Well, I will send you that kit. Um, yeah, for sure. And then I wanted to know about a moment in time. Well, let's check in. How you doing? I know because I've I've set it up where it's like I don't see anybody else except you. So I'm like we're in here together. But I know that it says there's 59 participants. Oh my goodness. Um, how we doing? I want to stretch my arms. Yeah, we're we're good. I'm 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 good. Cool. Um. Well, yeah, I wanted to ask about, um, well, yeah, I'm curious about like what your parents think about you pursuing art, you know? Like, I think you're one of the few people I know who's like first gen, whose parents were, um, uh, yeah, whose parents 
were like, yeah, you can do art. And I'm curious, because I met them at your graduation in undergrad. For right. Um, yeah, can you talk about that? Like, what's what do your folks think about that? Uh, yo, I mean, I hope I hope my mom's watching right now. Hello, mom. I don't know if my mom's watching. Um, it's hard, you know, it's like, um, okay, I'll pull back a little bit. I, I um, got kicked out um, out of my first high school. I, I got, I think I was failing, I was going through some like internal turmoil and stuff. I was failing, I flunked all my classes and I got expelled because I snuck in a friend into school and they were like, this is it. You're, you're, you know, you're, flunk, you're, flunk, you're flunking all your classes. And, and I, I'm like, a, I'm suffering, yo, like, give me a break. <laughs> and they, they like expelled me. And with, you know, my siblings help, um, they enrolled me in Chicago's first public arts high school. So I didn't want to do it at all whatsoever. It was like, I hated it. It's like Chicago's longest longest school day from like the morning till 5 p.m. <laughs> um, and I and I re it was like tooth and nail I like hated it and it was a survival thing my my older siblings and my family dynamics are very like fluid too like sometimes my siblings are more like my parents because they do a lot of like the bureaucracy work like applying to high school or like applying to college financial aid and stuff um and my parents kind of sometimes take on this like grandparent role in that they um, are sometimes the knowledge keepers and the um, they 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 they're more fluent in Spanish. So a lot of that bureaucracy is inaccessible for them to even like um, participate in. And, and so they shift a lot. And I have nephews that are sometimes like my little siblings. Um, but my my older siblings helped me in getting through that phase and. Um, so for a long time, it was out of survival. Like if, if, if I wanted to be a sophomore with the rest of the sophomores and not repeat my freshman year, I needed to be at that school. So a whole year I like dragged my feet and then started to really get into it. And partly with the friends that I made and the kind of like, like realization, like, oh, this is an opportunity to talk about these stories. I've been making work about the same thing since I was in high school. So it's like, whoa, I have all this stuff that I would like to talk about. And this is my way. So it's kind of one of those stories where it helped me um, realize a kind of voice that I could have. Um, and I ran with it. And my parents were always like in the place where it was it took the position of like, as long as it's like, what you want to do. And for a long time, I didn't know what I, I, I finished high school and I applied to art college because that's all I need. I kind of, I knew how to render well. I didn't know what, like, if this was my voice or what I, so I, for a long time until junior year in college, when I, when I switched from painting major to printmakers, when it clicked, that's when like junior year um, in college. And so up until then, I was kind of meandering, like we all are, like we all do or are doing or have done. Um, and my parents have always just been supportive as long as, and I'm very, I'm very, um, privileged to, you know, to, to, um, have parents like mine because, um, you know, out of the survive, you know, the need to survive, like, that's not a gift allotted to everyone. So it's like, um, yeah, I'm very lucky in that they've always supported me as long as I was like, ha happy. I guess that's the way to put it, you know, like um, doing doing the thing that kept me busy and kept me curious. What about you? Uh, man, my parents didn't, uh, you know, uh, my sister was like a prodigious like ballet dancer and won like a national beauty pageant. And so it was like, you know, that was like kind of the focus. And I was like kind of the dumpy little bro in the corner over there. Like, what is Martin? Yeah. I mean, I used to want to be a rapper and like, you know, I don't think, uh, yeah, I mean, they, I mean, my dad was always down. You know what I mean? My dad was always down. I don't think, luckily I didn't have parents that were like, you know, hey, you got to do this. You got to be an engineer and all that. Yeah, same. That's like, I mean, I think that's what I meant by like the gift 
to have certain type of parents like I know people get pressured to be like lawyers or like be something that will bring in my my older siblings weren't as lucky as as I am yeah they they started working with my parents when they were like young when they were like yeah. young teenagers because they needed all bunch of sources sources of income so it's like lucky to be born at the time that I did also because if I was born with them they're all they're all older they're all a year apart and then I'm the youngest by 11 years so it was like the privilege of being born at a time where money wasn't necessarily like the, the utmost priority um, yeah. if, if I was born with them I'd probably be needing to have that um, have a different type of life yeah, it, it sounds like, you know, you use the terminology like behind glass, right? When you're talking about your experience, mm. you know, not just in being a U.S. citizen, but also like in that age gap. I'm I'm curious about that because it sounds like uh, in a way that was like, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm curious, like what, you know, what do your, your bros and sis think about you know, what's, what did, how did they feel about the privilege that you've had? What is, what are those conversations? Like, how do y'all navigate that? Um, do you feel like a responsibility to honor them specifically and speak their story specifically rather than generals and generalities? Right. So no. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, a good question um we can do next if you want i got, I got some other ones <laughs> no i want to i, I want to think about that um it does feel a lot of like you know my my siblings were the ones that put me through high school and that took care um i have a, a an older sibling that has lived her whole life in mexico so I had two older siblings that I was close with growing up. And then, you know, when I was 14 or 13, I visited Mexico for the first time and met a stranger and was told, you know, to like feel the same way that I did with my other siblings and reckoned with the guilt that it, you know, I didn't feel the same way. And that's the truth. And that's like, um, how, how do you learn the process of love with a stranger that is your sister? And that's like something I'm still, I'm, st I'm still learning how to do. It's like not finished. It's not a finished work yet. I, it's, and it's everything. It's like the fragmented language. It's like the shyness that is involved with like engaging with someone who's culturally different. Um, the contradiction, because also you're, you're close, you're like blood. You're, I'm as close to, I'm like related to, my sister Yasmin as I am with my other siblings Jose and Erika and it's like that's a that's a lot to reckon with and I kind of don't know how to yet but in my work you know I whether it's so that's what it is it's like these connections are sometimes so fragmented um that I don't really know how to talk about them outside of describing them you know I'm describing them to you but I I don't really know how it I could further describe how it makes me feel. It's like super, super like illegible and tender. And I think in my artwork, I do celebrate and honor those stories, but they come across as like equally as fragmented and illegible. Um, and I only just started to make work about myself since, you know, March or like the summer of last year. So. So it's super new and it took me a while to arrive here. Um, I think for a long time, I looked to the world, you know, like the injustice of mass grave discoveries and um, using that event, you know, like the discovery of a mass grave or um, a certain amount of uh, um, migrant bodies found in a trailer um, abandoned in like rural like Texas or something using these instances to allude to stories that have influenced my life but I think as I'm keep making as I as I keep making those 
stories start to get closer and closer to my life. And um, yeah, so I, I think the answer is like, I just started to really think about what it means to share a lot of stuff that I don't know how to yet, you know? Yeah, for sure. I yeah. mean, about that the other night, but I mean, no, yeah, I mean, right. That's, I mean, that for me is like, you know, expressing like, that's what I do. I mean, it's different because I think we approach things like from different, like we have different ways we talk about, you know, experience. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, we were talking about this the other day, like about vulnerability and expression, right. And like editing, self-editing versus not. Um, yeah. So I know that that's in there. Um, let's see here. Let me look at my notes. Let me refer to my, my little notes here. Um, well, yeah. Okay. So this is, let's, okay. So, um, I know this public man, I, I mean, it's, it's interesting, right? Cause it's like, I personally believe the art world is white and it's talking about experience as like a Brown person. Right. It's like, you know, how wild and out there do you want to be? How, like, how real do you want to keep it about experience and truths do you tell? And I see myself oftentimes being a little too loud and proud about some of that. Um, but I'm curious, man, about, let's say it's just a space where it's like you and I, and yes, there's other people here, um, but in honoring vulnerability and expression, I guess we were talking about like scarification um, an archive and memory and things imprinted on body, right? Like use that image of like A for the for the world and then B as the imprint in this new story that's told. I guess I'm curious about like, if you'd be willing to share, is there a story that you experienced in your life that has left an imprint on you? Whether it's like a joy, a celebration or a scar, um, can you kind of talk about a moment in your own life that left where the world as A is the, the matrix left an imprint on you. Um. That was a good. That was a good wrapping up. Where <laughs> the world left an imprint on you. You are. You are the substrate. The Dude, world, looked the out world, there. The world is the matrix. Why? Well, I, I talked a little bit about some big things. I got kicked out of school. That was like huge, and I didn't realize I left a big gaping. Because you know, like that instilled a bunch of like valuelessness you know like uh disposability bro i got kicked out of two high schools so i mean yeah, I'm here, I'm here, yeah i hear you on that yeah yeah Shout you know, out higher you know. education what's up yeah you know what that's you know what that's like. yeah. like, um uh okay another experience um okay how about this <laughs> uh who are you listening? Okay, what are you listening to in the studios these days? No, I, I want to. No, okay. I'll go, go back to that story. I'm, right, gonna, I'm gonna stand up for a second and stretch. Because you know what? It's kind of difficult to be in front of a bunch of people and be vulnerable. It's hard. It's it's interesting. I'm nervous. I'm sweating through my sweatshirt. Go ahead. No, I mean a bunch of a bunch of things. I mean, it's just like I grew up. Uh, I'm trying to think of something like specific. Um, uh, what was the one that came to mind and you were like, oh, I don't know if I should say that or whatever or anything. It doesn't have to be anything or anything or. Yeah, I mean, all right. So this, okay. So the thing that came up, like as soon as you said that was like my, my parent, my parents is divorced. Um, my, my parents got divorced around the time I got kicked out of high school. And I think that's why a lot of like the stuff happened about getting kicked out, you know? Um, what does separation look like when like the both, both bodies are illegitimate under the, you know, like the government? Um, what does separation look like? What does, um, you know, we lived, we lived in a single family home together, you know, like when I was and what does it mean for like separation to happen in that confined space with all the older siblings living together with me and the young nephews at the time, you know, like they were young, like in grade school, like what does, what does that mean, yo? And it's like, that by far has left like the biggest imprint on me in like how to reckon with story. Um, 
because there's so much stuff, you know, there's so much stuff there, like, like, um, scarcity of resources at the time, you know, like, um, yeah. So that's like something like really like had an impact on me and that I, um, there's like this flattening that happens to narrative, you know, on the, I think often, you know, like, like as brown people, I don't know. No, I mean, as like, I mean, <laughs> wait, wait. so like as a, as a certain type of maker, right? Like you, I sometimes feel like the artwork and it's in talking about the arc again, like gets, gets flattened, really flattened because the audience, there's a certain type of consumption that happens in the art world. Um, there's a certain type of like politics that gets like talked about and a certain type of like um, way to go about inquiry that is super specific to one's identity about like um, someone's brownness or someone's um, like uh, uh, queerness. Like it's, it's, it, there's a particular way that the art world like digests information that I feel like, um, I feel like I, I sometimes am, am of service to, to that in, in talking about that codependency. Um, you know, like how to make things digestible enough or a certain type of digestibility that um, makes sense. Um, Bro, for and, real. I, and, yeah. and that, and just to go back to finish that up is that- Yeah, that no, story, keep rolling. That story is like so hard to even wrap my head around. And it's like, I guess that's where it's like this train is going, like eligibility and completeness and talking about these like micro narratives within the umbrella of like the undocumented body or yeah. the migrant narrative. So this is the umbrella and how to hyper focus on like the specificity of it, which is like really difficult to find language for. Um, but, but yeah, so that, that, that was like a really impactful time. Thank you for sharing that, man. That's huge. And that's really huge. It's thank you, man. It's like you went out there, man. That's a, uh... That's big stuff, you know, and I think in talking about consumption, you know, of, cause it is, you know, it's interesting, you know, being, I, I don't know Spanish, but I'm Mexican, you know, I'm Chicano, grew up in Texas. And it's interesting thinking about what work people make because I feel the expectation to make work about being Mexican. And I know that to whiteness and to white people that's legible a certain way and let's not get it twisted. The institution is white. Um, so it's like, if I want to be received by the institution, how do I make my experience legible to that? And how do I name that? And I think that we could talk about that for another two hours right there. But, uh, you know, I know it's getting that time and you tone it down. <laughs> but yeah, man, I, I mean, I think that that's just interesting, right? It's like, to what degree do you prepare your own experience for consumption? How do you explore something? You know, and especially in this time of social media, right? Like making posts like this is this. And if time is sacred, you know, it's like, how do you honor that in a world based on money? Um, okay, well, on that heavier note, let's let's come to a light one. Um, if you, if you, okay, because time is all happening at once. Um, let's reach back to baby boy, Jonathan. What do you want to tell baby boy? What do you want to tell him? He's right here with you, he's in your heart. What's the message you got for baby boy, Jonathan? Curious. Collapse time. Um... Uh, well, baby, Jonathan. Um, I don't know. I think like sometimes I have a hard time with like. I'm trying to be better with like, uh, like not having the tools for certain things. Like, uh, and we and we've talked about this. Like how to tap into like like ancient blood memory, you know, like um, how much of, of, you know, history is passed down through you and how much of, you know, of you, you will pass down ahead. Um, I, I think I grew up and, and little Johnny grew up thinking like, you know, like it was very individualized. Like this is, this is the world and I'm like just a fresh fresh baby with no, I'm like a sponge and like empty sponge and, and that, um, 
so I felt like a lot, like I had a hard time grappling, grappling, grappling with inheritance and how we inherit, you know, like trauma and things that are ours and also things that aren't ours, that we are vessels that it moves through. Um, I grew up with a lot of like, um, you know, survivor, survival, survivor's guilt in that like, um, uh, I've been, I've been in, I've been in the car when, you know, like family members, my, my dad have been stopped by cops and dealing with like, yo, I don't have a driver's license and what does that mean? Or like, and as a, I remember being as a kid, you know, when stuff like that happening. Um, and I had like a lot of guilt, like somehow it was my fault, like mine, like, like I, like my parents came to the US for like um, a dream and that I'm part of that dream. So somehow I'm also at fault, you know, like, um, and that's, so I grew up with a, but a lot of, a lot of guilt for just like existing, um, uh, being one of the reasons why a family would endure such a trek. But, and then I think now I just want to say like, you know, some stuff is yours and some isn't, and that's all right, you know, and it's going to be our life's work to figure out how to disentangle that what's mine and what's what's long what's super ancient and what's new you know dude that's beautiful man thank you thank you jonathan thank you man yeah yeah are, are we done no uh, well i saw Catherine pop back up on the screen uh and i think you know i think that was a beautiful message you had and then you know I, yeah thank you yeah thanks for coming out here and being vulnerable like that man no, yeah. Thanks for asking asking some hard questions. <laughs> I get to the second page. That's where the hard questions are. Hold on, dude. Hold on. <laughs> Thank you both so much. This has been a really great uh, conversation to listen to. I hate to even interject. Um, our first question from um, a uh, familiar name, at least to Martin and me, uh, Heidi from UMD. Uh, she'd like to know about your cool matching shirts. Um, yeah. Uh, so we both we both follow this Instagram account who's who's gone wild and it's like uh, um, look at it closely, huh? Go yeah. <laughs> Um, so it's a meme, it's a meme page and I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm not gonna talk for you, Martin, but you know, as someone, I mean, I think we identify a lot I, like in this way, but for me, a lot of, um, I grew up in Chicago. I grew up, uh, like I say over and over again, to like undocumented family. Um, but a lot of my culture is like Midwestern American. Um, and as the youngest, I grew up, you know, like kind of like, I don't know, like super, super inoculated. I don't know if that's the right word. Super like absorbed by, I was by everyone else. Like, um, and I uh, didn't, I, I didn't um, absorb a lot of like the cultural practices and patterns that rooted my family to a particular like place or culture. Um, so I get a lot of that information from the internet, like following um, you know, like, like Cal Californian, like artists, like painters in LA right now are like killing it and get a lot of my, like, I don't know, people who did grow up in like a very like saturated Hispanic culture. Um, again, like a witness from far away. And although I honor that that's not necessarily mine, like I didn't grow up in this particular type of um, lived experience, lived American experience, but um, I like to celebrate as a witness to um, those experiences. So I got Martine um, a birthday gift of, from the Foods Gone Wild Instagram account. And I got, <laughs> and we thought it'd be cute to share. Um, I think we identify a lot with each other in that, in like similar 
American experiences, but um, in that in the culture way, like access to other cultural um, fertile soil or like saturated by like a certain type of culture. Um, I don't know. I'm pretty um, Midwestern. I don't know. What do you want to say anything about the sweaters? Uh, yeah, who's going wild? Shout out. Thought about tagging them in the post, but I didn't. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the same thing, man. I grew up around white people, uh, my, you know, six hours north of San Antonio in Dallas, Texas. Uh, the men in my family is cousins, you know, like, you know, those are like, those are, those are some like chingons, you know, that's like some trouble shit. Um, excuse my language. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's one of those things is fool's gone wild. You know, I was like, oh, hell yeah, you know, for the culture, you know, it's a meme pitch. But it's, it's one of those things where it's like a way to identify with something that was maybe lost along the way. And I'll leave it, I'll say about that much. Hmm. Lost along the way is a good way to put it. Well, like that migrant, like the, like the migrant trail, you know, just like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Alyssa. Are the palette shapes altered or when you find them, are they mangled like that? I love the idea of hard labor referenced with the palettes. They take so much of a beating, work until you can't work no more. They really refer to a life's work. Love it. Might be over obsessed with these because I am a sculptor. I know how much they take a beating. Sad to see one not be able to be used anymore. Always weird throwing them away since they help me out a lot. Yeah. Um, that seemed like a string of compliments is, is what is there a... so the the question at the be was was uh, at the beginning i buried the lead uh, um do are the palette shapes altered when you find them or do you alter them um no i i i call it um when i add to them i tend to call it decorating in that like i don't i don't really alter the um the the integrity or like the bones of the palette um, it's beautiful, yo. Like, I, I spend such like intimate time with them. So I like see all the like intense gashes. The like sometimes they get sawed. They get um. I see that they get like sawed down sometimes. May maybe because they're like overly. I don't know. Like to get down to more bare wood. So I I've noticed these like really um, beautiful gestures in ingrained in the palette wood. Um, but, but yeah, I don't, I don't alter them. And I tend to, I tend to pull them from garbage. Um, they get thrown out, they get thrown out a lot and I drive around Providence and I, um, in the dumpsters and I, and I, um, pick them out and, um, and the only alterations I do make are, I, I, um, uh, what's the word? I gash into them with, with the, with the, a hot knife or like a, a wood burning tool to create that those scars that eventually make an image or a text um but yeah they they come they come they come to me as they are and i try to leave them as they are and hopefully the plan with them is to crystallize kind of like the debris and undoing is to um come together as an exhibition here in coking gallery uh, with, uh, in partnership with the BAI at Brown University. Um, and then hopefully my, my intention is to kind of dis, what's the word, disassemble them and hope and integrate them back into the circuit, hopefully. Um, uh, and then my dream is to, you know, like some, 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 uh, labor worker halfway across the world, you know, sees like a image on it and has a moment to think about it. And, I, and that's, I don't know, that's, that's kind of how I think is, is that the world or these palettes have so much to give already. So what happens if I just pull them in a different, put, put them in a different context? Um, yeah, so I altered them a little bit, but not. It's almost uh, like you collaborate with them. Yeah, 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 that's a good. And I think first and foremost, as an, as an artist, a lot of the decisions I make are um, visual. So there's wounds and gash, gashes and they come su sun, uh, weather, weather beaten sometimes and discolored and all that is visual information that I work with. 
you know, like it kind of like molds and um, uh, it's part of the process. So, so that's a good way to put it, Catherine, like the, it, there, it's like a co collaboration. So cool. Thank you. Um, next question from Joe. What, do you believe your work will heal you or your family? Why or why not? Yeah, yo, I don't know. Um, healing. Um, heal my family? No, because um, I don't know. I think that there's this like, um, let me go back a bit. There's stuff that like on the, on the range of things that need healing, uh, there's things that will never be healed, I, I, I think. I think the rupture of displacement is like so deep that there are things that I think um, uh, will go all the way up to the end of my parents' and my siblings' lives that go un, unhealed. But there is this gesture of uh, honoring, I think, that um, is healing like a balm, like um, uh, soothing the rough edges of you know that tra that ancestral trauma that um, is held um, in 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 our family story. Um, yeah, I think I think I think about it like that, like as a ceremony um, to 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 honor this the stories um and yeah it's hard this life is long and short so perhaps healed some things along the way um and perhaps other things will remain remain will remain fragmented um but i think that's that's this long work is to like um stick with it and to honor it and to kind of bring up in conversation um and to be more in conversation with with them it it really is uh the tether that binds me to them is my making um being strung out uh like in this life i think my my ceremony and my practice is like a really strong tether that binds me to them um yeah, that's a hard question, but I, yeah, I hope I um, touched on some things in, in, in there. I think so. I think the, the, the tie between healing and honor, you know, that was, the, that was a great answer, I think. Um, thank you. Um, Emily Garcia says, as first generation, I struggle with identity and where I fit in not being American enough and not being Hispanic enough. How would you describe your identity? Um, yeah, I think it's like, um, okay. So one thing that I can say was like, I think for a long time I felt othered. I felt like not, not with my family, not with, you know, the public school or like the art culture um, that I was like operating within. But there's something in like the acceptance of like otherness or difference that is in that is inviting, that is like kind of um, uh, rooted in a very like long, long history of people being like we don't belong to here or here so we're like our own thing and there's like i think i realize that a lot more people identify with this feeling of being you know in between than you know like i think i give myself permission to accept like i it's a projection that um uh it's as isolating as i feel because i think this isolation is like a def defense mechanism to like um, uh, 
I don't know, I think as a means of protection, but um, how do I identify? I think I identify as a, as a first generation um, US citizen, kind of in like this weird complicated way. Um, I, um, it's, it's hard, the work, the work is ongoing. And um, as I'm learning about the lineage from where I come from, it's, 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 it doesn't seem like it's getting any easier to, from, for me to figure out how to identify as, but I think, um, you know, sometimes when I don't know where to turn, I, I can still turn to my practice, um, which is a constant. So sometimes I identify um, as an artist first and um, as a maker first, as a, someone who is curious. And um, uh, sometimes it helps to identify as a maker for me, I think, when all the other stuff becomes like hard and so some weeks or some months you feel like you have an answer and then other, you know, to be washed away with when you receive other information. Um, so as far as my cultural identity, it fluctuates a lot, but I can return to the the um, uh, sturdy bedrock of like what's true. You know, I'm lost and I'm a maker. Thank you. Um, I know I, I'm conscious of time that we have two minutes left, but we have a couple great questions. Is it all right if we go just a little over? Yeah, yo, let's do it. Great. Awesome. Um, so we have an anonymous question um, from 505, so perhaps someone from New Mexico. Um, interested to hear him circle back to uh, the question about love and when time allows, what is your theory on how society will be after this forced isolation? And is anything ever done? <laughs> A follow-up. Um, about love and when time, uh, okay, about love. Um, love as prayer, prayer as ceremony. Um, we, we tend, we tend to the things that we love. And I think this act of ceremony is like attending to, you know, the matrix or like, uh, the subject matter or the stories that I, um, bring into the studio. So I think, I think love, you know, leaves trails of evident leaf leaves leaf tra trails of evidence um and love can manifest in a bunch of different ways but i think i think in the way that i choose to express love is through this like intentional thoughtfulness um and that could be in my relationships to other people or my relationships to my family or well, my family and other people or like to my practice but to to remove it of its yeah to kind of think about love as for love's sake, it's for me, it's, it's prayer. It's this like intention, intentional focused time and thoughtfulness um, with someone or something. Um, and yeah, how society will be after this forced installation, um, isolation. Yeah, like I mentioned, you know, like I kind of have been a witness to like what isolation does to like people and um, what it would be like, like, I think we're gonna have a hard time. All right, may, maybe I should say what I don't want. I don't want us to like somehow frame as what was as normal because it wasn't. Like I personally partook in a bunch of like, there was like times that I would be on a plane like every week or every other week for like this or that or that. and like to step back and slow things down. Like, I don't know if that's like the world we should be, be harbor, harboring, like um, for better or worse, like, I don't know, like Zoom and Google, like these companies are making like a lot of money, but we've shown that we could be connected and apart at the same time. Um, and there's this like, I think, uh, I don't know, this, this, this learning that has undergone. And I just hope that we like keep a lot of like the things that will help our relationships with each other and our relationships with the planet. Um, and that 
what was normal wasn't normal at all. Like the apocalypse happened for for certain people a long time ago, you know? Like like my my family has been living in a post-apocalyptic world for like decades. And it's and it's indigenous people have been living in a post-apocalyptic world for de- forever. And I mean for 400 years on this continent. And it's like I just don't want to go frame what was as normal and to try to collect as much of that as possible. I think there's lessons learned here and that we can all um, help each other and um, kind of hold, hold them as we, you know, these days go by and more people will get vaccinated and um, yeah, just help each other remember, like remember this moment before it's, before it's gone fully. I really agree with that. Uh going back as a regression, we, we certainly don't need. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, we have one final, oh, no, we have two more questions. Um, Samantha Russell asks, are you still thinking about cars and car culture or was that just another stop in your tourism of life? I often see it as mirroring of the art world, only more accessible to people that the art world can't reach. I grew up the daughter of a mechanic and artist and I'm now a sculptor and see their similarities a lot. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts. That's awesome. That's super mm-hmm. cool. I love, I love, I had this project going with this mechanic nearby. It, his name is Jose. And the project was going to be called Two Jose's because my older brother's name is Jose. This mechanic's name is Jose. Um, that's awesome. You were, your dad was a mechanic. That's like awesome to me. I don't know. I love the, going to the mechanic and I went to the junkyard for the first day, the, the first time the other day. And that was like super rad to be like in the junkyard with all the parts. Um, and anyways, I think, I think it is a stop on my tourism route because I'm a tourist in this life. Like I, um, I want to be honest to my experience in that, like a lot of it, like, all right, here's an example. I sometimes work with like, uh, my landlord in, in, in refurbish or reconstruct reconstruction or like working the interior and the exterior of houses like repairing I and I I I mainly do it because I get to be proximate to the uh, people from Honduras and Mexico that are actually doing that work um, as a as their daily ceremony that's their thing that's their that's their artwork um, and they tell me all the time like look this look at that look look how I cut this and how complicated it is because because it, it's artwork and it's their work, kind of like you were saying, like it's it's other people's bread and butter. Um, and for me, I'm I'm of course like a tourist that gets to like gets to step in in that pool for like a month or two, three or four days a week, and then go back to my studio practice when I'm busy. Like it's it's I'm I'm I'm, I'm a tourist in that way. Um, and uh, so yeah, so I feel like it is like a stop in my tourism route, but it doesn't make it any less like impactful or important to me in my heart or in, in my in, in, in my work. Um, it just is. And um, yeah, I've made, yeah, I don't know. Some of the most special connections I've made recently have been with like people who work on cars and mechanics and um, it's beautiful. Like thinking about the car as a body and people like tending to it and repairing it and using like um, resourcefulness as a tool and um, yeah I don't know it just feels it feels really good right now to be um, finding that uh, um, using that as a you know like fertile soil for work but also is like it's it's like I don't know like also really fun to to learn something new Um, I've learned so much stuff and um, it's been super impactful. And it's like bearing witness to a craftsperson, like someone who's really good at what they do. Um, it could be a sculptor or an artist or a printmaker, like a master printmaker, like, uh, and then, but when you really like talk to someone who knows what they're doing, like, I don't know, me- mechanics are super cool and they have a lot of knowledge. Um, so yeah, I kind of lost it a little bit, but I've been having a, a lot of important conversations and, um, it's that it's also that conversation you know like as an artist talking to people who make art in a different way they they sometimes uh i had this dude howdy from how howdy's auto repair 
be like, yeah, if you need more stuff for your things, like I, I can, I, I, we, we can coordinate a drop off. And it was, it's really fun. I don't know to collaborate with other artists, but their art is a different thing. Um, yeah, all of the stuff that decorates the palettes come from those type of places, like scrap yards, mechanic shops, um, construction work, stuff like that. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so we have a comment from, uh, one final comment from one of our Sherman Fairchild fellows at the museum. Mm. Um, I agree with you that growing up with first generation immigrant parents and being multicultured, multicultured rather, can be isolating between you and family, uh, you and your peers. It also lets you speak for those separate and different groups that you belong to and strengthen understanding. Um, so thank you, Edwin, for, for that comment. Yeah, thank you, Edwin. <laughs> um, well, that's all we have time for this evening. Thank you so much for joining us and, and being so generous with your time and uh, answering all of our questions. Um, and I know our UMD students really look forward to your virtual uh, studio visits tomorrow. So um, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and thank you, Martin. Um, it was wonderful having you both this evening. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Thank you to our interpreters. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Martin. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, we're a little bit over time, but shout out to everyone who's still here. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. I know I asked you uh, some questions there, and I hope that that was OK. <laughs> I'm a little, I was like, oh, buddy. I, yeah, you know, I hope I didn't step any lines. I'm a line stubber. Uh, yeah, thank you, Catherine. Thank you to the interpreters. Um, thank you, Miguel. Yeah, and thank you, uh, Philip Fletcher and UMD and Texas fam and friends that came through to see the event. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, have a great evening, everyone, and take care. Be safe. Thank you so much, Jonathan and Martin.